Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm uh, joined by the uh, Chief uh, Medical Officer, Professor Brendan Murphy, and we'd uh, like to provide an update on uh, coronavirus uh, globally, nationally, and additional responses. Uh, at the global level, uh, the number of cases has now exceeded 88,000. Uh, that's uh, diagnosed, obviously. Uh, we recognise that uh, that is the formal number and that in parts of the world the actual number may be significantly higher. Uh, we now have uh, almost 3,000 uh, lives lost, very sadly, and uh, that includes, of course, the uh, uh, loss of Mr Kwan here in Australia. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the number of uh, countries and regions who have uh, reported a first case has now grown to 67, uh, and that includes uh, additional countries such as the Dominican Republic, the Czech Republic and Luxembourg. Within Australia, uh, the total number of cases uh, is now 29. Uh, an initial 15 uh, that came from uh, China uh, or had been in uh, direct contact with those from, uh, from China. Uh, as a result of that, uh, all of those were isolated, treated and all have uh, cleared the virus and returned home. Uh, Ten cases uh, from the Diamond Princess where we uh, brought those Australians home and uh, they have been in quarantine now for over a week in Howard Springs. Um, sadly, as we, as we learnt yesterday, uh, James Kwan uh, from Western Australia uh, was the first Australian to lose his life. It was obviously deeply saddening and uh, tragic for uh, the Kwan family, but for many others who would have been affected along the way. Uh, as well as that, though, uh, we now have four cases from Iran, uh, one in Queensland, uh, two in New South Wales and one in Victoria. Uh, all have been uh, isolated, all are under treatment and, most significantly, contact tracing has uh, been started by the states and territories and, in the case of Queensland, they have set up the first respiratory clinic uh, to uh, test and to let any patients who have uh, been in contact uh, with the uh, Iranian uh, traveller have a place to go where they can have dedicated uh, uh, testing, treatment and analysis. Uh, now in response to all of these, uh, we are meeting daily through the uh, Chief Health Officers and the Chief Medical Officer Chairing. Uh, in particular, over the course of the weekend, as, as you're aware, we increased the uh, travel advisory uh, to Iran and uh, uh, as part of that uh, put in place the travel bans. Um, we have also now, I can announce, increased uh, the travel advisory for Italy uh, on the advice of the Chief uh, Health and Medical Officers around the country. That has been raised to level two for the whole of the country and level three for selected towns in the north. Uh, level two uh, means uh, have a high degree of awareness and level three is reconsider travel. Uh, significantly, uh, as well, the Chief Health and Medical Officers have uh, recommended that uh, if you are returning from Italy or South Korea and you work as a healthcare worker or as a residential aged care worker, you should not attend your regular work for 14 days. And so that's uh, an additional level of protection which has been uh, advised by the uh, Chief Health and Medical Officers and accepted by the Australian Government. I might ask uh, the Chief Medical Officer, Professor Brendan Murphy, to add. So thanks, Minister. So I think as we have been saying for some time, uh, these additional cases that we've seen over the weekend from Iran were expected. And I think, as we also said, over the weekend, we had a very high index suspicion that the caseload in Iran was much greater than being reported because of the death rate. And so even though we, we have a relatively low travel volume from Iran, we have had these four cases. And that's why Iran has been a particularly special case and why, whilst we haven't been uh, pushing at the Chief Health Officers for more travel bans. This case was one that was particularly to avoid the burden of travel from Iran. So as the Minister said, we've had these additional cases, but as we've always said, we are extremely well prepared 
in Australia. So all of these new cases are being contact traced, being managed as, as the last cases were by the state and territory uh, public health officials. We have, as Minister Hunt said, still got concerns about Japan and South Korea, but they are uh, working hard to control their outbreaks. But we are still concerned that people who come back from those countries and any other high-risk countries may present with a COVID-19 infection. The most important thing for anyone coming from an area of risk is to monitor their health and isolate if they become unwell with any sort of flu-like symptoms, contact their doctor or their hospital and let them know. That's the time when people are most infectious, is when they're symptomatic. The additional precaution of asking people to isolate from Iran and for those people in working with vulnerable people from South Korea and uh, Italy, particularly northern Italy, is because some people may develop mild symptoms and we wouldn't want to expose uh, health healthcare situations or aged care situations to people who might be early in the stages of a disease. But the most important thing, anyone who's come back from a country with a COVID-19 outbreak who gets unwell in any way, please isolate yourself and contact medical advice. Thank you, Minister. Phil? Professor, how would you describe the situation today compared to this time last week? Is it any worse or is it better? Or you it is pretty much as we expected. Uh, with the developments over the last week, with the significant spread in the outbreak outside of China to a number of countries, now over 60, and many of them with uh, some significant outbreaks. As we said, we are in a position where we are going to expect to see more cases in Australia. And we are prepared, and we are preparing for even, even greater numbers. We've got lots of preparation underway across the health sector, and we are in a very good situation of preparation, but this is pretty much as we expected. Can you detail um, what happens to people in at airports when they're arriving, uh, for example, in transit from a country that may have a ban in place, um, onwards to somewhere that doesn't have a ban, or uh, and stopovers, and also people who are arriving, um, are they who's being who's being checked, and what procedures are in place for people who do have illnesses? Are they put, being put somewhere? Is there a special room in airports where you're dealing with people, or special teams of medical staff? So I, I will say this: there are isolation procedures available in. Uh, all of uh, the airports where we have international arrivals, uh, Border Force and Agriculture together have been uh, putting that in place. Uh, in particular, what we have done is we've set out those countries which are high risk and therefore being specifically uh, investigated upon arrival, uh, and that will continue to be the case. But also all arrivals uh, will be receiving material about the circumstances that they may face if they have come from uh, overseas. And uh, I know that uh, both Agriculture and Border Force are working together on this. If they have come from overseas, uh, they'll be receiving materials about uh, if they have any of the symptoms, steps to take in Australia. You've upgraded the advice. Are you considering a travel ban itself? And what is in the advice in relation to a travel ban for Italy? So I think it, it's very important uh, to set out the process here. Um, what we do is, uh, where there is uh, medical advice, um, then we will follow that medical advice. And so we've uh, allowed the chief health and uh, medical officers to uh, operate in full confidence that uh, they can make their judgments based on um, sound medical assessments. They've been ahead of the curve. They have uh, helped us as a country be ahead of the curve, knowing that the National Security Committee uh, and DFAT have, have and will continue to accept their advice. And so by giving them the freedom to operate independently, uh, we've been able to get the best advice. And I've got to say, um, Australia has not just prepared, but we have consistently preempted. But we've done that by allowing uh, not just uh, Brendan, but all of the um, Australian um, Health Protection Principal Committee to operate as uh, independent advisors. What was, what was the medical advice against a ban on Italy and South Korea at this stage? So, let so, so the view at the moment was that 
Travel bans are, at this stage, when we have an outbreak in many countries, a, a way of delaying the burden of new cases coming in. It's no longer possible to absolutely prevent new cases coming in, given the increasing changes in epidemiology around the country. So in the case of Iran, there's such a high risk that a travel ban is worth doing because it will slow down the number of cases. You cannot stop Australian citizens coming back. Some of the cases that came back from Iran with the disease are Australian citizens. It's a way of slowing things down. At the moment, the medical advice was that the situation in Italy and South Korea, where they have large outbreaks but they're confined and being localised, the risk uh, the proportionality of putting in a travel ban wasn't justified in terms of its benefit to the health protection of the Australian community. So just following up on that quickly, if we were to impose a travel ban on Italy, uh, would that require a wider ban on the EU because of the Schengen Agreement? Is that one of the factors? No, uh, I, I might answer that one. Uh, what we've done is we've uh, made decisions based on individual country risk, as the medical advisers have uh, provided that advice. As you've seen over the weekend, uh, we didn't hesitate uh, at the uh, start of February to impose what was, of course, a very difficult decision uh, to stop uh, people coming from China other than uh, Australian citizens and permanent residents and their immediate family. Um, and that did have very significant uh, ancillary consequences, but we made that decision. And the freedom that the medical advisers have is to give their advice and the commitment that we have is to work with it and to embrace it and to accept it. And so that remains the situation. Over the weekend, uh, well over the last week, advice to upgrade this, the uh, advisories and travel warnings with regard to Japan and Korea and Mongolia, uh, advice on Iran over the weekend advice now on Italy that has been lifted. Uh, and so our commitment is uh, we will continue uh, to implement the measures which the medical uh, advisers recommend. Professor, could you please speak to some of the, 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 the latest science we know on this? Is there any more information about the prevalence of cases spreading before these symptoms? Is the 14-day quarantine still best advice? Where are we at on the latest there? Sure. So the 14-day quarantine is still what we think uh, the best advice with a margin for error. The evidence is coming out that the incubation period is generally less than 10 days, uh, but we are keeping the international community is keeping the 14 days to provide a window of safety. We do believe that there are some people who are, whose symptoms are so mild that they may be almost unaware that they're infected, and particularly just, be, before, just as they become uh, infectious. So that's one of the reasons why quarantine is still being practised for very, very high-risk situations. But all of the evidence suggests that people are most infectious when they're symptomatic. So that's still the most important piece of advice, to, to isolate when you're symptomatic. So can I just clarify on my early question about transit? and stopover um, travellers. Do we have those people coming through our major airports to countries that don't have travel bans and how do we treat them if we do? Uh, so our situation remains that where we have uh, travel bans in place, those are blanket bans, uh, in relation to Australia, but any particular details I'll refer to uh, Border Force and uh, get them to respond so to you directly. If you, for example, from Iran transiting through Sydney going somewhere else, you're not allowed? Well, we have a ban on people arriving in Australia from Iran who are non nationals. The Andrews government has. Um, Sorry, I missed that. The Andrews government in Victoria has criticised the federal government for delaying the release of names of people on board a flight to Melbourne from Bali on the 23rd of February. A woman on that plane had coronavirus. What's your response to that? I'm not aware of that criticism. I was with the Victorian Minister uh, on uh, Friday and they were uh, effusive. We stood together in a press conference and they uh, said nothing other than uh, thanks and uh, gave strong support to the, uh, to the federal government. So uh, everything we have, uh, we're sharing as soon as we have it. Uh, I am not aware of the circumstances in that case because it would, would be border force, but I imagine they are collating uh, the entry cards and the details, and uh, as they have it, they provide it. Professor, does Mr Klein's death um, call for a review of how you've treated um, 
patients coming back from the Diamond Princess? Does anything else need to change? No, not at all. I think um, this very unfortunate death was, we we're always going to have a first death and as we know, people are more susceptible to a fatal outcome when they're older and frailer. Um, I think our response with the Diamond Princess was exemplary. We brought these people home, we have quarantined them and, and a number of them have developed the disease whereas they, they might have otherwise been led into the community and infected people on planes. So we've protected the Australian community but all, anyone who became unwell in Howard Springs in Darwin was given the most high level medivac back to their home state and put in the best possible care. So I think the the Diamond Princess uh, repatriation was an exemplary piece of public health. Yeah, I will uh, add something to that. Um, there are those that uh, didn't want us to impose a, a quarantine on the Diamond Princess passengers. And I reala realise it was a very, very difficult and stressful situation for people who, through no fault of their own, had been in two weeks quarantine and through no fault of their own were subject to a further two weeks quarantine. Uh, but the alternative of uh, letting them out uh, on commercial planes and then into the community we know would have seen at least 10, 10 passengers, 10 now patients, uh, be in a position to spread the virus again through no fault of their own. And so that decision to both bring them home but to provide supervised quarantine with uh, really the SAS of medical teams, the OSMAT teams on site testing daily uh, has put them in the safest position but it's put the community in the safest uh, position. I'll take uh, one last from Phil and was then it, we'll have it, to... Was it a mistake in hindsight by the Japanese authorities to keep the people on that ship and not put them in a, a more effective form of quarantine rather than those ships which always act as incubators? I think the Japanese faced a huge logistic problem with so many people and where to put them. I'm sure they are deeply reviewing the strategy that was used at the time. Well, yeah. we, we made the decision we made because it was clear that the quarantine had not succeeded in containing the virus on the ship. That is absolutely clear and borne out by subsequent events. Uh, one more question. Uh, there are still 150 Australians in Wuhan who have been living uh, you know, through this you know, like nightmare, I guess, in many ways. Uh, many of them children. Some of them are running out of medication. Some of them are running out of food. Uh, Australian government doesn't seem to uh, want or have the intention of rescuing them. What's your message to them? I, I would say this, that there were unfilled places on some of the flights. Uh, so, uh, everybody was contacted and all were offered. Uh, however, we are constantly reviewing the situation. At this stage, however, we have uh, no further plans for evacuations out of Wuhan. All right, thank you very much. We will have to have to finish now. Health Minister this morning. Sorry? The ACT Health Minister mentioned a shortage of um, protective equipment this morning. She said that the uh, national stockpiles needed to be lifted. What, what, what are the numbers there? What's uh, happening? Uh, what we announced on Friday is that uh, as part of the work of COAG, uh, we're constantly reviewing primary care, aged care, uh, hospitals and the medical stockpile. Uh, we're continuing to, uh, to do that. I met uh, this morning. Uh, with the head of the TGA, uh, Professor John Skerritt, who's reviewing all of the medicines requirements in Australia. Uh, it was actually very comforting. Uh, his, uh, he has a team within the TGA that is looking at medicines and all medical equipment in Australia. Uh, they already have that uh, role, but they have stepped that up. And uh, what he was finding in terms of medicines was stronger than uh, I had uh, hoped, which was very good. And in terms of uh, personal protective equipment, we have a national stockpile which has 20 million, but we're always looking to add to those 20 million masks and other items. The suits, not the masks. Uh, if the ACT Minister has any questions, I'd be delighted to receive them. I met with the ACT Minister on Friday and uh, we discussed, amongst other things, uh, personal protective equipment and that wasn't raised on Friday. So if they have any further issues, we're open, either myself, the Chief Medical Officer or the National Incident Centre. Look, I, I, will, I will say this. These are all immensely important questions and uh, this is a time of... Uh, concern for many people in the community. At this stage, we, uh, in the last few weeks, we have had the four cases in the community. Uh, we got ahead of those with the travel ban 
uh, from uh, Iran to Australia. And this is all working to a very clear structure of the declaration uh, by the Chief Medical Officer of pandemic potential in, in January, the uh, travel restrictions that have been imposed, but most significantly, the standing up of the uh, National Incident Centre, uh, the National Medical Stockpile, the National Trauma Centre, and then the development of the pandemic plan and then the activation of the pandemic plan. We are at the first stage of three stages. Think of it this way, it's uh, effectively uh, containment, and then in stage two, we have delay and mitigation, and in stage three, we have recovery. And we're still at stage one, but for the Australian people, uh, the preparation is immense. The ability to adapt uh, and to deal with it is a national task shared with the states. And so whilst we're not immune, we are prepared, and ultimately, we will get through this. Thank you. Thank you.